interest of time, we're going to go to Luke chapter number 24 to just underscore so much of what we've heard this morning, so much of what we've seen and, and read, and I'm going to invite you to just imagine what does it mean to take seriously that we can rise from the rubble. We can rise from the rubble. Scripture says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning mm, stood beside them in their fright the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men, the men standing there in the clothes, the angels, if you will, asked, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they, the women, remembered his words. And when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. These the fellas who stayed behind. Verse number 10, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women. Because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up, ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Man, we're going to again talk from rising from the rubble. Let's bow our heads and just ask the Lord to bless our time of preaching. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you, God, to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Somebody holler, I will rise from this rubble. Now, Easter, as we know, or as we may not know, is the culmination of 40 days of the liturgical calendar that is called Lent. It is a time set aside in the global church to remind ourselves to celebrate, to continue to live into the reality that we serve a resurrected Savior. But the 40 days of Lent did not skip over the Holy Week, the Passion Week, a week of great trial, a week of great tribulation. You must appreciate, beloved, that if you were here last week, many of us were waving some palms. You got to appreciate that Jesus seems like he must have had a really bad week. I mean, he started out being celebrated, started out being hollered and named Hosanna. And one week later, literally, Jesus is on a cross, next day being buried. How many of you know Jesus had a bad week? It is not unlike many of us who can testify that there are seasons in our lives where we start with great celebration. We start with people giving us a diploma, giving us a proposal, giving us a promotion. But how many can be honest that things can change real quick in the course of our lives? Jesus started out getting celebrated, and by the end of the week, uh, the empire has successfully criminalized Jesus. Jesus started out getting worship, but by the end of the week, they have falsely arrested Jesus. The soldiers that racially profiled Jesus, they... They slapped some, some, some shackles on Jesus, and Jesus was not just treated unfairly by those who did not know him. Jesus also had a bad week with those who said they loved him. Jesus had a bad week when his friends, who just some 
days before said, we ain't never leaving. We riding or dying with you, Jesus. <laughs> Bring it on. You know, I know there's some haters out there, but we ain't going nowhere. We got you. Anybody ever had a crew of folks that was like, we got you. <laughs> I'm with you. And then, you know, you standing up in court there by yourself looking behind you like, Or you, 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 you locked up and ain't nobody there to put money on your amen. books. Ain't nobody there to come see you except your mama. Thank God for the mama. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus had a bad week because he realized that even though there are people there that will say, I walk with you, sometimes seasons change and people change and we change. Jesus found himself by the end of the week, executed on a cross as a criminal for defying the religious and political systems of his day. I want you to know, beloved, that there are times where we will not always find the consistency of the life we thought we would have. There will be pitfalls. There will be Moments where we must acknowledge that, man, I thought I did it all right. And here I am, alone, forsaken, or troubled. But I am so glad that there is an ending to the story we know from the beginning that offers us a continuous reservoir of hope. And if we ever needed that reservoir of hope, we need it today. If you were here during the Christmas season, many of you will recall that we have been standing in solidarity with our loved ones in the region and area of Palestine, those who have found themselves victimized by the bombardment of the Israeli government in the aftermath of the October 7th attack, but certainly decades of occupation and brutality and injustice. And what we did during the season of Christmas is that we said we would literally stand with our loved ones in Palestine as they proclaimed that Jesus was with them in the rubble. But you will also recall that we also acknowledge that Although there's rubble over there, and that rubble is largely due to the tax dollars of we, the American people, providing the bombardment bombs and, and, and the missiles that are disproportionately and indiscriminately killing innocent civilians, we also realize that in the midst of all of this tragedy, these friends of ours in Palestine were emerging with a faith that challenged so many of us to declare, I will see Jesus in the midst of my rubble. Here we are now in Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and I can't help but think about the boundless and bottomless faith of the most vulnerable among us who seem to always be able to find God in their most desperate moments. It makes me ask the question, God, are you with me in my rubble like you're with them in theirs? Has anybody ever asked yourself that question? God, are you with me in the midst of my tragedy like you're with my big mama? You know, because all of us got a big mama that seemed like they always, even in hard times, figured out a way to find God. They always knew a prayer to pray. They always knew a sway to do. Oh, baby. <laughs> God going to take good care of us. And you're sitting there looking at them like, man, we, 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 all we got is bread and mayonnaise. Why don't God hurry up? <laughs> but it is indeed the case, beloved, that just like there are challenges and tragedies Abroad, there are also tragedies and challenges in our own lives. Because what is true for us is that the reality of bad days and bad weeks and bad seasons and even a tough and terrible life, they are part of the ebb and flow of every human experience. 
But on a day like today, we say confidently that the same way Jesus came to interrupt the status quo of empire and useless religion in his time. Jesus continues to show up amidst the pessimistic seasons of our own lives to remind us that the rubble cannot steal our hope. As a matter of fact, I want you to know, beloved, that there is a group of the faithful that are emerging and rising out of the rubbles of our lives to declare that death does not have the final say. And just like we did today, censoring the voices of some of our own community members at the way, allowing their stories to bring life to the power of resurrection amidst the rubble of loss and disappointment and life transitions, I want to point now to this text, to the story of resurrection. And rather than just focusing alone on Jesus, I want to focus on a few of the characters real quick because I think there's something about these characters this year. That really drove home to me the possibility of resurrection. Because one thing you and I must acknowledge is that Jesus' ministry and Jesus' death did not just bring an immediate end to Roman Empire. Occupation and subjugation of the native populations of that land. Jesus showing up and Jesus dying and even Jesus resurrecting did not cause the Roman Empire to just go away. That same day, how many know that the power that Jesus rose with did not end all of the struggle that actually produced Jesus' death? It forces me to sit with this truth that sometimes the miracles and activity of God won't always bring immediate end to our struggle. There are going to be moments and seasons of our lives where we will undoubtedly experience a miraculous expression of God's love and God's power, but our conditions may not change overnight. Sometimes we're going to have to keep pushing in the midst of our struggle, believing that God is at work even amidst the rubble. And this is what I love about this particular expression of the resurrection story because when you take a look at the characters in this story, I think they give you and I a couple of of, of ideas of how we can rise amidst the rubble of our lives. In the character uh, uh, highlights of this story, first you got the sisters. Oh, God bless the sisters. The women, they show up and Luke's account, as well as the other gospel writers' accounts, tell us that they showed up to the tomb first. Mm -hmm. The sister showed up while these mighty brothers were hiding out at the crib. I get it. You know, I'll talk about the brothers in a second. (laughs) But I do find it so fascinating that the women showed up at the tomb and it ought not be taken for granted how risky it was for them to show up in the dark at a tomb where they knew some soldiers was going to be there waiting on them. Don't you know, beloved, that when you have deep love for a thing, when you have deep faith for a thing, when you have devotion to a thing, it will cause you to take all kind of risks. And I am one of these people who are struck, particularly in this story, by Mary Magdalene, who in this story, the story of the Gospels, the, the, the recorded life of Jesus, Mary Magdalene was certainly described and believed to be a sex worker. Someone who had to depend on these relationships with other men to make her life sustainable 
and functional. And we ought not forget that during this season and time, the only reason or the most reasons why women would be in this position is because of the hierarchy of the day, the vulnerability. Women couldn't work back then. She was most likely either abandoned by her husband, she was most likely widowed, meaning her husband died, or her family disowned her. She was there by herself. And her first experience with Jesus changed her so much, she was willing to risk it all and show up at the tomb, listen to this, and maintain her humanity in the midst of inhumanity. That's my first point, beloved. We can rise from the rubble when we show up amidst the rubble while maintaining our humanity in the midst of inhumanity. Somebody repeat after me. I must maintain my humanity in the midst of inhumanity. Is there not a lesson in here for all of us who are overwhelmed by the ubiquitous nature of death around us? Even here in this region, we are overwhelmed by the narratives of crime and violence. We got folk who created websites, Oakland State of Mind to be one that seem to always be around when a crime is happening and always find a way to get it into your algorithms. So you and I can be literally upset and afraid about Pookie and Ray Ray, who out here is stealing from Gucci and stuff, praise God. It's Gucci stores. I had somebody tell me, Pastor Mike, don't you think it's wrong that they stealing from Gucci? I was like, Gucci, it's gonna be all right. I'm not excusing it, but you know, uh, you know, why are you so turned up for Gucci? Amen. I, did Gucci put something on your books or something? I don't know. But it is true that there are moments and times where we are overwhelmed by the ubiquitous nature of desperation, hardship, violence, and death, whether it is in Haiti whether it is in Israel, Palestine, whether it is in East Oakland or Richmond or Hunter's Point, we are people who are constantly being asked, how should we respond in the midst of all this inhumanity? Well, I want to tell you, beloved, that the way we who are resurrected people are called to respond is to not lose our humanity. And at least death and destruction the way empire does when it's trying to respond to the desperation of the very people they have created the conditions for to create death and destruction. But we, the followers of Jesus, just like these women who show up early in the morning to anoint the body of Jesus at risk to themselves, they realize that there's a level of love and devotion and faith. And so because of this devotion and love and faith, I will show up even while the empire is still killing. Can you imagine what it would look like if all of us who believed in the resurrection said to ourselves, we're going to keep showing up. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to find myself in solidarity with those who are suffering. Why? Because I know that if I show up in this way, I may stumble into a miracle. Right. Lord, help me. Help me to be a person who believes that miracles can arise from the rubble of loss, grief, and death as long as I keep my humanity intact. Yeah. So the first question, beloved, can you arise from the rubble of loss, grief, and death keeping your humanity? Can we resist the urge to maintain the status quo while we arise with a renewed sense of spiritual power? that maintains our humanity in the face of inhumanity. I believe there's something spiritually empowering that is before us today. If we can decide, I will not become that which I am most afraid of. But I 
will be a follower of the resurrected Savior. Let me move on here. Let me get to the fellas in this story. Not y'all in here. Somebody say amen. But the guys in this story, they're such an interesting group of characters because you got the disciples who first the scripture says they did not believe the women because it just seemed too ridiculous. And I'm not too hard on the fellas because if someone came in here today and told me they saw Kobe alive, <laughs> as much as I would want to believe it, I'd be like, man, somebody gave you some bad drugs last night. you, Or maybe some good drugs. I don't know. Praise God. I mean, no, for big parts of my teens and 20s, folks were convinced that Tupac was walking around. Maybe some of you still convinced. <laughs> and Tupac is, I mean, it's interesting how we're hard on the people in this story, but we certainly will believe our own conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about that today. Come back next week and I'll get in your business. Somebody say amen. But the guys in this story, they arrived late to the tomb. But there was also another set of guys in this story, not just the disciples, but also the soldiers. Those who worked for the empire. And their assignment was to maintain the status quo. In this story, you got fellas who are late to the tomb, Jesus followers. And then you got soldiers who are assigned by empire to just maintain the status quo. Now what distinguishes between these two groups of fellas, I think, are what I pray distinguish between us. The soldiers, kind of like some of us who are caught in the lie of respectability think that we can't ask too many questions. I'm just here to get my check. I'm not here to get too involved. I don't know why this guy got killed. I don't know why they, but he must have did it. He must be guilty. So I'm just here to make sure that whatever the empire tells me to do, even if it may not resonate with my values, I'm just going to do it. But the men who showed up, although they showed up late, they still showed up and they found their lives transformed. Why? Because sometimes all it takes is a spark to get the fire and the flame of resurrection going. And beloved, these brothers showed up, Peter and John, the scripture says, ran to the tomb and they end up there and they start to remember what Jesus said, what happened to them. It reminds me, beloved, that even in our most difficult moments, there are seeds and memories of God's promises that are within the hearts and the spirit of us all. And sometimes it just takes a spark, a glimpse of God's fulfilling power to resurrect our hopes and dreams even amidst the rubble. Yeah. I'm so glad that transformation happens even amidst the rubble. There may be brokenness in your rubble, but there is transformation that can happen along the way. And even when you leave. Don't just think that God can only work in our lives absent of the trial. It is my experience that God works even in the midst of the trial. That God begins to bring back to your memory all kinds of ways that God was faithful. I can imagine Peter showing up to the tomb and he sees the empty tomb and he begins to remember, man, Jesus told me this was going to happen. I can imagine Peter starting to feel a little bit ashamed in the days and weeks before saying to himself, you know, I saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. How is it that I forgot when Jesus healed the man who was born blind? How is it that I forgot that Jesus was able to take a few fishes and some, some bread and feed 5,000? Surely Jesus has the power to do things I've never seen before, but now this takes the cake. 
Jesus is able to take death and absorb it and turn it into a situation where new life has begun. And I want to ask you, beloved, what have you forgotten about Jesus in the midst of your rubble? What have you forgotten about the potential power of God to transform us in the midst of our rubble? Could it be that God is trying to give you a glimpse of what God can do if you can just hold on and keep showing up to the place that you thought that you had no doubt? And it was finished. I love Peter because Peter, he gets turned up now. You know, Peter, he was the fighting disciple. He was the cussing disciple. He was the one that liked to cut people's ears off. Peter would cut you if you did something, you know, that was out of pocket. Peter would knock you upside the head. Peter was a thug. He was Jesus' hitter. Somebody say amen. And, and Peter kind of lost his resolve, but eventually Peter got his, you know, his, his, his little bone in his back. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up in a crowd of 3,000. And this is what Peter said. He said, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right and is acceptable to God, you know the message that God sent Jesus to preach peace and be Lord of all. So now God has raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. And all the prophets testify about this Savior that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Uh, that, that, that experience with Jesus at the tomb turned Peter into a preacher, turned him into a proclaimer, turned Peter from a hitter into a proclaimer. I want you to know, beloved, that some of us got to ask ourselves, God, what are you trying to turn me into? What kind of new person are you raising up from the rubble of this life? I don't have to stay the same, but I can become brand new. Because this is the power of resurrection. Oh, last thing, three more minutes, then I'm going to let you go. We can't talk about Easter without talking about Jesus. Talked about the women. Talked about the brothers. Now let's talk about Jesus, the one who had a bad week, the one who took the brunt of it all. Jesus was described as the savior of the world in every account of the Christian witness post his resurrection. But I want you to think about how Jesus was described as he went to the cross. He was described by some as a teacher, described by some as a rabbi. But we must not forget that Jesus was also convicted as a criminal. We serve a justice-impacted, formerly incarcerated, death row, executed savior. I know we got these nice depictions of Jesus with the blonde hair and the blue eyes and the bad perm, and he 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 just smelled real good. And Jesus walked in the room and just whew, was just, uh, Jesus was a roughneck. Jesus was from the tough part of town. He was a criminal. He survived. Listen to this state terror. He was abandoned and betrayed by those closest to him. He was killed. He was buried. And yet he rose above all of it. With enough love to save the world. We are followers of this Jesus. Not the imperialist Jesus of the United States of America. Not the racist Jesus of the slave master. Not the Jesus that Donald Trump puts on these crazy Bibles that he's trying to sell you. We serve a Jesus who literally took the worst that evil had to give him. Absorbed it and literally returned it as love. 
enough love for you and I to say yes to God. I'm not asking you to absorb all the evil of this world. I'm asking you to consider following the ways of the one who did. Why? Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us to raise us from our dead places. We can arise from the rubble because Jesus has already shown us how. Resurrection Sunday is not about Easter bunnies, although I ain't telling you to steal it from your kids. Let them have all the candy they want. Because we ain't about that either, you know. We, we dechurchify. It's okay. Some of these practices, they, 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 they okay. They, they ain't going to make or break your salvation. As long as you are consciously aware of what Jesus we are following. Because there's a lot of fake Jesus running around out here. And the Easter Bunny is the least of your concerns. <laughs> Hello, somebody. There is a God that wants to use us as instruments of change, healing, and transformation. And it's within our grasp today. Will we say yes to this resurrection? Come on, stand with me, everyone. Let's take a few moments. And if you don't mind grabbing the hand or touching the shoulder of someone next to you. Yes, reach across the aisle. That's fine. That's fine. Leave no one untouched. Let's make a human chain of committed, resurrecting power today. Because you are the living word, God. You came to show us the way, the truth, and the life. And so today I pray for my beloved who I'm touching today. I pray, God, that you will give to them peace, power, strength. I pray, God, that you will remind them that today the rubble need not determine their destination. But, God, they can arise from the rubble. They can arise with a transformed heart, with their humanity intact. They can arise from the rubble with the same spirit that raised you from the dead. And that a rising God can bring new life into their fractured and fragmented soul. And so I pray for them. I would squeeze gently their hand just as an expression, God, of your concrete presence in their life today. Send your spirit. May it run from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. May it, God, alive in those things in them that have been hard to fathom, hard to process. May it, God, cause them to continue to reach for life and second chances and new beginnings and renewed sense of purpose. And God, if they are here and they are finding themselves locked in a cycle of death and desperation and depression and disappointment and loss and grief, I pray today, God, that you will find them just like your spirit found us. Whether we were in a tomb, whether we were in a jail cell, whether we were in a library, whether we were in the university, whether we were on the corner, whether we were in the church pew, wherever we found, were, God, you found us. And you breathe new life, breathe new life into my beloved who I am touching right now in the name of Jesus. Now lift those hands right where you are. Just lift your hands and say, oh God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, it's not my father, it's not my sister or it's not my brother, but it's me, Lord, and I need you. I need you to save me. Somebody say, save me, Lord. I need you to heal me. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. I need you to deliver me. Somebody say, deliver me, Lord. Make me brand new and send your spirit that causes new life. Thank you, God, that death did not have the final say. 
Thank you, God, that we can call your name Jesus and we can be convinced that you are alive and that you are at work and that we are your followers and that life is within our grasp. We say thank you, God, for rising from the rubble. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, hug two or three people and tell them, I see you rising this morning. I see you rising. 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 Doesn't that feel good? Clap your hands if you're glad that you're rising from the rubble.